So for those of you who don't know me, my name is Shankar Vishwanathan. I uh, work for AMD uh, and um, uh, so I mostly work on uh, chip design, uh, been dabbling a little bit on the software side as well of late, but uh, most of my um, most of my day job is on um, uh, working on uh, performance of uh, our uh, products. So that's what I do during the day. And then, um, you know, so for this talk, uh, I just wanted to, um, I know a lot of people ask me about how memory works or you know, I'm building a PC, why is this slow or why is that fast? Uh, and I just wanted to explain um, uh, overall kind of what when, when I say memory, what that means and, and, and how does it work. So um, uh, so in terms of agenda, I'll go through from a hardware perspective, uh, what are the memory types and the hierarchy, how DRAM works, how SRAM, which is what we use in caches, how does that work? And then a really, a really very brief descript description of what, what we mean by coherency and consistency. So those topics by themselves are, are subjects of you know, very many PhD dissertations. So we could spend hours on just, on just how hardware coherency and consistency works, but I just wanted to give you a quick flavor for what we mean by that. Um, and you know, kind of what's with the title? So I have some links here. So there was a paper by Ulrich Trepper, who's uh, who at that time was in Red Hat, and I believe he's back there now after a, after a short stint somewhere else. Uh, but he wrote this paper that said uh, what every programmer should know about memory, and it was kind of tongue in cheek because it was a riff on an earlier paper um, by David Goldberg that was titled "What Every Computer Scientist Should Know About Floating Point Arithmetic." And that paper went into you know a whole lot of detail about floating point math, which <laughs> not everybody needs to know, but uh, but uh, uh, yeah. So that was the evolution of that of that of that title. Anyway, I want if you read that paper, uh, it's like a um, it's really a booklet. It's not a paper, um, and uh, and uh, there's a, there's a lot of detail in there. Um, it's a little dated, um, so it's it's you know 15 plus years old at this point, uh, but there's still a, I, I still would think majority of what Ulrich has in his paper is uh, is, is still true and still valid. Um, but you know, in this talk, I'm just trying to give you a brief introduction to to what that is. It's it's somewhat inspired by the paper, but it's not really following the paper. Uh, and by the way, like just stop and ask questions anytime. I, I don't want to be the only person talking for for an hour. Uh, <clears throat> so uh, when we when we talk about computer memory hierarchy, I'm sure a lot of you or everyone is familiar with this, um, uh, where at the top of the pyramid we have you know uh, registers within the CPU that are very fast and, and very expensive. Uh, and relatively small in number, so small size, small capacity. And at the other end, you know, um, you have uh, offline tape backup. Um, uh, and even if it is online tape backup, it's 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 very slow. Uh, but the capacity is several orders of magnitude uh, higher. And then you have all these different things in between. Um, you know, caches. We'll talk about them. Um, those are those are fast and 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 expensive. Uh, then we have RAM, uh, which some which is fast enough, but uh, you know, still limited in terms of how much capacity. Um, flash, uh, uh, NVMe, those kinds of things, which are a little bit slower, uh, but you know, still you know, cheap and then getting cheaper by the day. Um, and then you have you have hard drives. So, um, <clears throat> and then some of them retain state when power is taken away, others lose their state, right? So that's that's the overall um, hierarchy that we, that we talk about. So 
um, let's first talk about, about DRAM. I mean, registers, um, I will not talk about it. There are very few in number uh, and are limited by the, the instruction set. Um, so there's not a whole lot we can, we can, we can do, but um, DRAM is something that's interesting and I'll talk about that. So fundamentally, when we, when we uh, talk about hardware, what do we mean by DRAM? So um, from a hardware representation, we call it 1T, 1C. This is the most common type of, of DRAM implementation, which is basically, um, if I can find my mouse pointer, um, it's, it's one uh, transistor and one capacitor. Uh, and whether that capacitor is charged or discharged uh, determines whether this, this uh, DRAM cell holds a one or, or, or a zero. So fundamentally, this is, the, this is the basic building block of all kinds of DRAM. And so you take one of these and then you stack them out in a big, um, big array and you put several of those arrays on a, on a, on a, a DIM and you, you get what we understand as, as, as a DRAM. So you have, um, uh, you have uh, some you know, N by M matrix of these, of these uh, cells. Um, and what you, what you have are, are, now if you want to read a particular value, uh, you need to send a row address, which is decoded by this row decoder. And then you have a column decoder for the column address. And that's how you get the particular bit that you, that you want. Um, and there are multiple of these. The, these are called multiple banks. Um, uh, and we'll get, we'll get to see why uh, banks are important. But essentially, um, what, what this is is a way of getting multiple bits out at the same time. Because in each of these banks, there's only a few bits that you can pull out. And the more banks you have, um, you can access this, um, this bank, and then you can go on to the next bank, and then you can get data out of there. So it's, it's a way of improving performance uh, and capacity uh, of the overall DRAM. Uh, so uh, you know, there are several types of DRAM, the standard DDR. Uh, then you have low power DDR, which is Typically, so DDR is generally either in 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 DIMMs or so DIMMs or something like that. Although it, that can also be soldered down, LPDDR is typically soldered onto the motherboard, and it's the lower power variant. And you would see that in um, you know phones and laptops and things like that. Um, uh, GDDR is is graphics DDR, and that's what you find in um, GPUs, right? Graphics cards, uh, console products, things like that. And then the last one is HBM or high bandwidth memory. Um, this is where the memory is um, stacked on top of uh, the compute chip, uh, uh, either CPU or GPU, and it offers very very high bandwidth, right? So what what um, what is different between these? And so fundamentally, all of them are built using that same 1T, 1C cell that we saw earlier. Uh, the only difference is how those banks get organized and uh, how we access them. Um, and that, you know, has, you know, ultimately uh, at the system level defines uh, how it behaves. So um, DDR is relatively... Um, low latency and uh, uh, and you know gives you high capacity LPDDR like like I said is still reasonably high capacity but it's lower power uh, and higher latency compared to DDR GDDR because it's it's for graphics um, um, is um, much higher bandwidth uh, at the expense of latency because GPUs care less about latency and more about bandwidth. So GDDR is optimized for those kinds of applications. And HBM is also, as the name suggests, very high bandwidth, uh, uh, but it's very expensive uh, because it, it is um, kind of 3D like stacking um, that's still very expensive. But 
you know, over time costs will come down. Graphics DDR is also, GDDR is also more expensive relative to, relative to DDR. Uh, but, uh, you know, they all have the same types of building blocks. Uh, and um, for interleaving, you'll, you'll have heard these um, different terms uh, when discussing memory performance, channel interleave, rank interleave, bank interleave. Um, so what what channel interleave is uh, is typically you have um, uh, multiple uh, separate memory paths, uh, memory buses uh, going out uh, on the motherboard. Uh, <clears throat> so you you so typical desktop chips these days would have two channels, uh, and then higher end uh, desktop servers could have four, eight, sixteen, you know, multiple channels. And each of them is you can think of as uh, uh, as an independent way. So you can you can you can fire off two different reads or write requests in parallel to these two different buses, um, and you essentially get twice the bandwidth. So um, uh, so if you have two channels, and let's say you populate DIMMs on on each channel, uh, and and you have uh, let's say two gigabytes in 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 each channel. Um, if you just organize your physical address such that zero to two gig uh, goes to the channel on the left uh, uh, here, right? So any address in the bottom two gigabytes goes here, and the upper two gigabytes goes here. Well, um, you know most applications when when you allocate memory, it's not going to put some memory here and some memory there, right? So um, you can't really take advantage of these um, of these uh, parallel paths from the same application. Now you can have one application allocate memory in the in the lower half, and the and the other application um, have uh, memory or data in this upper half, and then they can run in parallel. But if you want one application to go fast, uh, what you need to do is interleave the memory, which means first. Uh, let's say 512 bytes goes on this side, the next 512 bytes go over here and 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 so forth. So um, it's not entire zero to two gigabytes here, but you know in these small chunks. So this way, if you just have a serial um, access, right linear access and you and you need to read in, let's say four kilobytes of of data uh, from from memory, you're not all going to the same channel, but you know the first, in this example, 512 bytes would be fetched from here. The next 512 bytes can be fetched from here, and so forth. So that's channel interleave. Rank interleave is also sometimes called chip select interleave, which is where so a rank is where if you if you have a standard DIM, um, you'll have chips on both sides. So you'll have memory chips on one side and memory chips on the other side. If you have memory, if if you have a DIM like that, that is typically called a dual rank. So you have two ranks, so each rank being one side. Uh, and then um, um, uh, uh, you can, you can uh, send off one command to one side of the DIM, and then in the next one, send a command to the other side, and you can interleave your request that way. Because, um, uh, you know, I, I guess I should have mentioned it. Going back to this picture, right? Fundamentally, what the, the limiter, because you're dealing with a capacitor and has has a certain amount of time to charge and discharge that limits the rate at which you can go back to the same DRAM over and over again so the only way to achieve higher performance is to put out more of these arrays uh, and then go read them um, in parallel as much as you can because coming back to the same bank again would would involve some penalties as we'll as we'll see so you're fundamentally limited by physics of that capacitor. The transistor can switch very fast. At you know we can make it run at several uh, gigahertz, but the capacitor time is going to be very slow. So um, uh, so all these techniques that we really have used uh, to get faster and faster memories is to um, is to exploit some parallelism rather than making that one capacitor be faster. Although that also works, but you know there are some fundamental fundamental limits. 
so um so that's why we have all of these schemes to appear to give the appearance to the cpu that the memory is faster uh and and really all you're trying to do is to hide that time for the capacitor to discharge and charge you're going trying to hide it by going to different places uh you know rather than hitting that same capacitor back to back uh, and that's the that's the idea of these interleaves. So ranked interleave is like I said, the two sides of a dim, and then banks is within within um, uh, within these number of chips. Uh, there are there, there's this concept of banks because uh, each of them is organized in multiple banks, and you want to hit different banks so that you can you can parallelize the data as much as you can. Um, and then the other concept is unify, uniform memory access versus non-uniform memory access. So I just have a picture here that shows, um, you know, one of AMD's Epic processors. So you have multiple CPU cores. So these Z4 are Zen 4 cores. There are multiple of them connected to this interconnect in the middle. And then you have all these memory controllers um, on the two, two sides. Uh, talking to these dims. Uh, so, um, you know, in, in a, in a, and, and then you can have, you know, dual socket, right? So you have two of these. So, um, uh, uh, in, in, in this example here, if your memory address is somewhere over here and this CPU has to go read it, um, that's obviously going to be much slower than this CPU going off and reading some data from, from this channel over here, just physical distance for the, for the request to go all the way across and then the response to come back. So this, is, so this kind of thing is called NUMA um, or non-uniform memory access. Um, and the, the best thing to do is to, um, is to uh, split your, your request such that you know, any process that runs here mostly runs on memory that's attached to this uh, uh, socket as opposed to going to somewhere over there. Um, in uniform, you, you know, it's more or less every channel has uh, equal latency and, and this is all part of one NUMA partition. Although in this case, you know, there's even, you can imagine this, if there's a CPU here, it's going to, um, going to this channel is going to be much faster than this uh, same CPU going off to this channel. So there's also ways, depending on the product, uh, where you can take this system and partition this into multiple NUMA domains. Um, so uh, all this basically means is that you're trying to um, minimize the latency from when your CPU needs some data to when the memory can, can respond um, uh, with the, with the, with the uh, come back with the data that you need. So um, when people talk about uh, UMA versus NUMA, it's it's uh, whether all requests see approximately the same latency, or like here, uh, depending on where the request goes, you see drastically different latency. And your application needs to be aware of that. And and like I said, um, uh, your OS uh, more likely needs to be aware of where the task is running where the data um, that that task needs is and try to schedule it uh, to minimize these latencies. So if all your data is over here and you run a thread on one of these cores, it's going to have poor performance. Um, so you're better off um, scheduling that thread on one of the processors over here. Any questions? Um, feel free to ask. Um, Otherwise, I'll keep going. All right. So, um, so when we talk about DRAM, um, there is there is a bunch of timings. So uh, the most, uh, you know, and when you buy a DIM, you'll have some of these timings listed on it. The first one here on this list is the cast latency, and this is perhaps what most people focus on. But it's one of many things that determine overall um, DRAM performance. So, so CAS latency is basically from when the memory controller 
um, makes a read request uh, to when the data is available for the controller to use. So that's the round trip uh, memory um, latency. Uh, and it is, it is important, but there's a, a lot more, as you see you know, list here, uh, a, a lot more. And so for standard DRAM, like DDR, you'll see perhaps uh, these first four timings uh, coded, right? Uh, which is the, 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 the CAS latency, uh, TRCD is RAS to CAS. So um, the way the, the, uh, where did we go? Um, the way um, we, we access DRAM is first, we have to say, uh, send the, the row address. And uh, what that does, it will activate the particular row. So this, this decoder uh, decodes the address and then figures out which, which of these rows is being requested. And it activates that row. So it's called an activation or a RAS, um, uh, row access strobe. It's not a strobe anymore, but that name has stuck, right? So, so it picks this row. And then later you send the column address to then figure out of all these uh, bits in this row, which bit do you care about? Or which, or it could be like a, at a byte layer a level in which you say, which set of bits do I care about? And then these uh, muxes at the end will pull out, pull out the data and put them in these buffers. Uh, and uh, once all the data is in the buffers, uh, this data is returned um, to the to the processor, so this is what happens on the on the DRAM device uh, side. So you have a you have a row address sent, and sometime later a column address sent. So there are timing. There is an TRCD. Basically, what it says is how much time do I have to wait before I send a row address uh, from from when I sent the row address to when I can send the column address, because that's the time it's going to take this device to decode that address, uh, activate that particular row, and then get the get the data uh, ready, right? And then the column decoder picks which set of bits that you want, right? So, um, so TRCD is very another very important um, timing, uh, which which dictates uh, how fast you can get your memory. Um, the next one is TRP. Um, this is a little um, harder to explain, but it's basically a RAS to a precharge. So in DRAM, when when going back to this transistor, uh, the when you when you read uh, uh, this uh, this bit, you basically you you basically fire up the the word line, which means this transistor now conducts, and then if there's a charge here that that will get sent onto this bit line. Um, if it's a if it's a one, this bit line voltage will increase, and if this uh, bit is zero, uh, this bit line voltage will not increase. And then these sense amplifiers are the ones that detect the tiny increase in voltage on these bit lines, and then they uh, they can determine if that's a zero or or, or a one. So, um, but but you, you can imagine now, right? Because you did a read, it's destructive. This charge is gone. Uh, and, and this, this, uh, this uh, bit, uh, this, this no longer reads as a one. It's become all the charges depleted. Uh, so we have to do what is called a refresh, which means, uh, or a pre-charge. You have to go and charge this capacitor back up. So if the bit is, is, is a one, uh, you need to go and apply a voltage here and get this uh, capacitor charged back up. And that's called a, a pre-charge. And what this TRP says is how long after I do that activate can I do the pre-charge? Uh, and so, and if you don't pre-charge, then that, that value will get lost. So, uh, you know, this is another timing. And then the RAS is like once I activate my role, how what is the minimum amount of time I have to keep it active before um, I can I can close it. So th there are there are all these uh, timings, uh, and these first four are typically 
uh, what you would see on the sticker on 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 a dim uh, and they'll just code them as four four numbers it'll be like 16 12 12 14 something like this right those are the string of numbers that you would see on a on a dim module and yes uh, the cast latency the first one is probably the more important but some of these things also matter and um, I won't go through everything, but TCCD is basically uh, uh, usually a smaller number. And it's when you've already uh, activated one row, uh, I can send out column A request. And then sometime later, I need more data from the same row. Uh, I can do another CAS without doing a, a RAS. So then, um, then you know uh, what is the time between sending two successive column addresses to the same row. And TRRD is, is uh, when, uh, when I open one row to when I can activate another row, how much time do I have to wait? TRTW, this is very interesting because uh, DRAM bus is not, uh, is, a, is a bidirectional bus, uh, but you can only send data in one direction at a time. And if you need to say, I need to flip from doing a read to do a write. So instead of data being sent this way, you have to send something the other way. There are some termination stuff that has to be done electrically to flip the direction of the bus. Uh, and so you have to wait a certain amount of time for that to happen. And so um, when you, when you, if you, if you uh, do a read and then you want to do a write, you have to wait for that bus to flip. And that's typically a very big delay as well. So, um, uh, so all of these timings matter when you are when you are um, uh, looking at DRAM. Thankfully, the hardware, the memory controller, a good one, will take care of all of this and try to schedule everything optimally. Um, but if you are if you are uh, somebody who is determining what kind of DRAM to buy. Uh, the spec sheet will have all of these all of these timings, and the lower they are, the better and more expensive. Um, so here's a here's a quick. I won't go through all this in 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 great detail, but basically, uh, you know, this this directly came from Micron's uh, spec on how how their DRAM chips uh, chips operate. But basically. Um, when you're doing when you're doing a write, this is assuming the the, the row is already activated. Uh, you send out uh, the write command, and along with that, you are sending the bank address and the column address. Uh, you send you send those, uh, and then uh, you know you have to wait this write latency. It's typically two cycles lower than the CAS latency. So you wait this amount of time. And then you send the data onto the data pins. So this is the command bus, and this is the data bus. Um, and 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 the the memory controller, when it wants to do a write, will send this command, wait this many cycles, and then it'll start sending the the data. And and you can see, um, you know, there are two. Oops. Um, uh, uh, there are two clocks here, which. Uh, which are out of phase by 180 degrees. Uh, and this is used for uh, DDR, which is double data rate, and data is sent on both the, the, the rising edge as well as the falling edge of the, of the clock. And if you notice here, um, uh, the, 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 uh, it's, it's very hard. So in logically, what we do is we send a pair of clocks one like i said they are inverted of each other and so you send the first beat on the rising edge of the clock and then the next uh, beat on the rising edge of the inverse clock and so when you look at it from just the, this one it looks as if the data is being sent on both the rising edge and the falling edge of the clock and you would notice that the data is not sent you know the data isn't changing when the clock is changing it changes a little bit earlier. Um, this is because when this clock goes high at, on the DRAM side, uh, the, the, the device is going to look for the data. And you want it to be stable. So you don't want the voltages to be changing when this clock 
uh, edge triggers. So um, all of this has to be done as part of an elaborate training exercise uh, to find the, the center of this. So what is the delay uh, uh, that I need to do before the clock changes so that when the clock reaches the destination, uh, you are in the center. So this is called an eye and your center at the eye. So, um, so all these um, modern, at, at these higher speeds, uh, we have to do something called memory training, uh, which determines all of these delays and these parameters uh, through a very, very elaborate process during, um, during initialization. Uh, so that was a write, and here's an example of a read. Um, so same thing, uh, you send the read command on the command bus, you send the, the bank address and, and the column uh, address that you want to send, uh, and then uh, CAS latency number of cycles later, you can go read the data bus and the data is expected to be there at that time. So, so this is the the CL latency, um, CAS latency that I that I mentioned. Uh, but after you do a read, uh, you have to do a precharge uh, uh, because I said, like I said, read is destructive. So you have to wait um, TRTP, right? Um, uh, RAS to precharge this number of cycles be before you can send the send the precharge command. And after um, um, after you've done the pre-charge, if you now want to activate or open another row, you have to wait uh, this TRP number of cycles before the next activate happens. And the activate is basically, like I said, the opening of a row. So you send the, the bank address and the row address at that time. So this will open the row uh, and then you have to wait the the RAS to CAS delay, TRCD, after this in order to send the next, the column address that you want to read. So um, this is all <laughs> very, very elaborate. And then the, the controller has to manage, um, the DRAM controller has to manage all of these um, uh, situations. And this is what I said, write to read. Um, uh, after you do a write, if you want to do a read, uh, you have to flip the, the bus around, and so you have to wait this uh, this uh, parameter, so TCCD, so CAS to CAS with the write to read uh, delay. And so this is often pretty, pretty um, big. So you do the write, you know, the write data you sent off, but then um, you have to wait this, this number of cycles before you can do a read. And, you know, so the goal is to have this, data bus be as full as possible. So at all times, you need to be transferring data to get the full bandwidth out of the out of the memory, out of VRAM. And here you can see there are all these periods where this bus is idle. And um, and so you are you're not going to ever get your peak bandwidth. So uh, so when 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 you know you you see the 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 memory you know dim will say oh, max bandwidth of you know x gigabytes per second uh, in practice you will never ever achieve that uh, except in very 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 contrived uh, cases uh, because of all of these kind of delays and 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 things uh, there's always going to be some periods where you're going to be unable to use the bus but you know there are tricks right so if you have multiple requests uh, in the queue, uh, the DRAM controller can say, okay, every time flipping from write to a read is very expensive. I have to wait this many, this many cycles. So instead, what I'm going to do is pull out all the writes that I have, all the write commands, do all the write commands as quickly as I can, pay the penalty once to, to switch the bus from write to read, and then I'm going to schedule all the reads back to back as or, or as back to back as possible um, so that I'm not paying this right to read penalty for every time. So if you have if you have a command sequence that says read, write, read, write, read, write, then you're not paying um, this kind of penalty for for every pair of requests. 
except instead you do read, you skip the write, you do the next read, and then the next read, and then you come back and do all the writes. Um, as long as you're not uh, violating any ordering requirements, uh, uh, that is fine, right? So you don't, if, if you have a older read to a particular address and then some later write uh, comes to the same address, now those you can't um, switch around. Uh, but barring those situations, if these requests are to different addresses, um, you, can, you can do this reordering and uh, try to extract uh, the highest possible bandwidth uh, out of the system. Uh, and <clears throat> um, I stole this chart from JDAC, which is the body that maintains the, the DDR and GDDR, these kind of standards. Uh, I can never remember what <laughs> the, the, the thing stands for, uh, but uh, but they're the they're the body that standardizes on on these uh, memory um, technologies, and and you know you can see on the left here like um, you know the memory capacity um, has has increased as we go from generation to generation, and also the interface speed has has um, also gone up from from generation to generation. But fundamentally, that capacitor hasn't gotten all that faster, uh, and so all of this speed improvement and the and the bandwidth improvement is really by coming up with additional tricks, like I said, to uh, to hide that latency of that capacitor charging or discharging. Uh, <clears throat> so, as I as I mentioned, you know if if you are a hardware designer um, doing a memory controller design, um, it's a it's a very very difficult uh, task. Uh, so your your basic goal is to maximize that utilization of the the DRAM data bus. Like I said, you don't want idle cycles on that bus. You need to be constantly transferring data. Uh, but now you have to manage all these timing constraints, uh, and it's highly dependent on the on the sequence of uh, commands that you get, the addresses that you get. Uh, so you have to look at all of the addresses coming in, all the types of commands, how many reads, how many writes, and then and try to figure out dynamically what is the most optimal sequencing of these commands so that I, I minimize the number of idle cycles um, on the bus. But that's, but that's looking at um, maximizing the bandwidth. Right, but then you can have cases where um, where some things are very latency sensitive, right? So let's say I have a bunch of writes uh, that I that I uh, have to do, and then there's some reads in between. Now the prudent thing from a from a latency sorry from a bandwidth maximization would be to do all the writes, then come back and do all the reads. But what if that one read in between is is some very critical request, right? The CPU is completely stopped because it is waiting for, for that response to, to come back, right? So it could be like a if statement, right? If x equals 4, then do something else, do something else, right? Now you have to go read x. It's in memory. Um, and then you have to wait for it uh, to come back and, and, and com do the comparison to then determine what I want to execute. Uh, and so you really want that X uh, read of X to come back as quickly as possible. Uh, so uh, so you might want to prioritize that read because you know something is you know something might be dependent on this one. Uh, but that if you schedule the read now you have, now you have to pay, pay the write to read and then the, again turn around back and pay the the read to write uh, penalty and that that hurts your bandwidth. So you have to now balance these competing requirements of, of latency versus the versus the throughput. Uh, and then you have you have uh, these other requirements for quality of service uh, of what might be uh, clients that are that are real time in nature. So for example, audio and, and display controllers have very strict requirements in terms of latency and bandwidth, right? 
So audio data, the bandwidth is fairly low, but you know you have to send the data out to the uh, to the audio device and out to the speakers within a reasonable interval. Otherwise, if you don't send the data, uh, you're going to hear this like big pop from your speaker, which is extremely annoying. And at the same time, and similarly, if you if your display isn't able to read all the data that it needs to paint the screen. Uh, you're going to see pixelations or screen tearing, um, things like this, which are also not great from a, from a user experience perspective. So the, the memory controller has, if you have these kinds of clients in your chip, right? So, so like a typical phone chip or a laptop chip would have all of these elements. Um, uh, or, or a camera device, right? You need to capture an image within a, within a reasonable amount of time. So all of all of these have very strict uh, requirements. So uh, you know if if display requires some data while somebody else wants to do some writes, well you have to make a decision now. Who do you prioritize? And then it could be some other higher level goals, right? Like fairness. Like every you you can't just because something is optimal, uh, you can't not you know you can't say, I'm not going to schedule this particular request. I'm just going to wait. And that may not be fair to whichever is uh, the, 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 the piece of hardware that's requesting made, made that request. So there is like a fairness thing. And overall, system level forward progress uh, goals uh, that have to be met. And then there could be power efficiency and you know other kinds of things. So all of this um, needs to be kept in mind uh you know um in, in the micro in the memory controller and all of this has to be done you know for cycle after cycle and determining what is the best uh, what is what should be the command that i send next to the to the vram device um so that was background on on um dram uh and now let's talk about sram which is static RAM, which is what we use in, in, in caches. So as opposed to a DRAM, which we saw was uh, you know, one transistor and one capacitor, uh, typically SRAM cells are built out of six, um, six uh, transistors. And they're effectively two um, inverters hooked up back to back with two other transistors, gate transistors on, on, on either side. Uh, but in terms of organization, it's very similar. Uh, you know, you you take this basic cell, this holds one bit, and then you put that in a, in an array, and that's how you get your SRAM array. And the the operation is is um, slightly different. You don't have some such as all those like strict timings uh, like you had before, because reading or writing uh, because reading this thing is not a destructive app. Uh, you know, operation. You don't have to pre-charge the value. Even if you read it, this thing is still going to retain its its value, and therefore, this is much faster. Uh, and um, you know, you still have the, the 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 row column address decode and things like this. But this um, these are all transistors. They can be made to switch very fast, and so this uh, SRAMs operate much much faster than than DRAM. Um, and but because they they require six transistors instead of you know a single transistor and some capacitance, um, these are much much more expensive to build, and therefore uh, we we have to have limited sizes. Uh, <clears throat> so caches uh, are usually uh, built out of these SRAM arrays, and the idea is that you hold. Uh, the most frequently accessed data um, in the processor. So here's an example of a of a Zen Core physical layout, um, and you can see these different uh, modules there. Like you have the you have the decode logic and the register file, floating point unit, and so forth. And then you see these big hunks of uh, of memory, which are in this purple or this this red here. These are all SRAM arrays. And so you can see the, the the majority of the area of a CPU core is basically for all the storage. Uh, 
significant portion of the, the area goes into caches of various sorts. So you have the data cache, you have the instruction cache, uh, the TLB, as we'll find out, is also a cache. Uh, and then you have L. So these are the two L1 caches and then the, the L2 cache. Uh, so uh, in terms of the cache organization, this is sort of a logical view of what I just said. You have um, instruction cache and, and uh, data cache. We, these are the level one caches. And these are relatively small and um, they are the, they are the um, fastest. Um, then you hit a level two cache, which is uh, uh, much larger, uh, but they're also slower to slower to uh, access. And so one of um, so this is an example of a of a Zen four uh, design. Uh, you have you have um, thirty two k instruction and data caches, a megabyte of L two cache per CPU core, and then you have multiple of these cores sharing a much larger L3 uh, cache. So, you know, it's a it's it's like of the order of five, th three cycles or so to get here, about eight, 10 cycles to get here, and about 30 cycles to get here. So it's, it's, it's progressively larger, but also slower to get to. Uh, and then some designs, uh, you know, also have another layer layer of cache called the last level cache. Uh, so the so this in this example here, this L3 is only usable by these CPU cores that are connected to it. Uh, but you can build a last level cache, which can be used by other units uh, within the within the overall chip. Um, so for example, your graphics or your or your um, neural processor, all of these other subsystems um, can can uh, put data in that cache so <clears throat> um, so this is this is how a cache uh, looks like so um, you have what we call multiple ways uh, and each way basically has data tag and a, and a valid bit and the tag is really nothing but the the upper parts um, of the of the um, address. So if you have this 30, in this example, you have a 32 bit address and you want to go access, uh, see if this address is present in the cache. Um, you use kind of the lower eight bits in this example as an index into, into your table. Um, and then you look up the tag that you stored there and you see if that matches these upper 22 bits of your request. If these two are a match, then you know you have the full address in this location, and this and if the valid bit is set uh, is true, uh, then you have valid data uh, here. Um, and because you can have multiple different addresses that have the same bottom eight bits, right? Uh, you can have a lot of aliasing. Uh, what we do is we build multiple ways, which are all indexed by that same lower eight bits. Uh, but you can hold different pieces of data in these four ways. And so you have this logic at the bottom that once, once you um, look up this particular index, uh, you read all the four tags out of there, and then you see if your particular address it matches one of those tags. If that matches, you have a hit, and then uh, you use that match logic to determine which of these data should be the one that's sent out. So for example, if, if this 22 bit matched the tag over here and this valid bit was set, uh, then you know this is the piece of data. So you pull this data out and you will set your um, select for this multiplexer to pull that particular data out and send it out. So this is yeah. how... Mm -hmm. I just wanted to let you know that Mad Dog posted a question in the chat. Uh, you might want to take a look at that. Ah, oh, sorry, I missed that. Um, what type of memory is used for microcode of a six CPU? So the microcode is typically in a ROM, so it is not modifiable. Um, and some of them uh, will have uh, some portions in a in a ROM that is not modifiable. 
and then maybe they will have a little bit of uh, SRAM um, uh, next to it, where some portions of the of the microcode can be reprogrammed later. And the next question was, uh, am I correct in the idea that DRAM is not clocked properly, the capacitors will discharge even though the power is kept to the memory? It's it's not about clocking. It is it is um, it is uh, you're right. So if you you have to do these things called periodic refreshes. So even if you don't um, don't uh, read or write a particular uh, cell in in DRAM, that charge can leak over time, and so uh, periodically you have to do this refresh uh, where you go essentially read the data out and write it back um, in the set. And in doing so, you you uh, charge the capacitor back up. So you have to do this and um, and that will, so during those portions, um, those banks of memory will be, will be um, unavailable. And that's why having more banks um, helps because while one bank is being refreshed, you could still be reading something or accessing something out of the other banks. And, and, and static RAM, SRAM does not have this problem uh, because all the, the 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 data is not stored in the capacitor, it it, it will not leak. It's just stored. Um, it just kind of recirculated through the through the transistors. And then that other question was: SRAM is expensive in terms of chip area. Um, yes. So um, um, physically, SRAM is bigger, and therefore it is uh, it takes up more area on. Uh, on the silicon chip, and more area implies more cost uh, to manufacture that. Um, and power-wise, actually, SRAM is is uh, lower power uh, than than DRAM. So for the same amount of capacity, SRAM will uh, will consume lower power than than DRAM. A because you're not dealing with a capacitor that, like I said, will leak. Um, uh, transistors can leak too, but they leak at much lower rate than than DRAM. And then you have to do all this refresh and all this um, other business to keep the DRAM going that you don't have to do in 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 SRAM. Therefore, SRAM is typically lower power for the same capacity. Sorry, I I wasn't paying attention to the chat. Um, thanks for the reminder. So, yeah. So when when initially this whole cache will be it will be empty. The first time you uh, want to access read a particular address, uh, you'll go look up the cache. Uh, they'll all say uh, data doesn't exist. Uh, all the the valid bits are probably zero at that time. Uh, so you will miss uh, in this cache. You will send that request out to uh, memory DRAM. Um, DRAM will respond with the data. And then you go put that data uh, into this, right, into one of the ways. Uh, and so the next time uh, you access um, uh, that address, the data will be there and it's much faster to, to get it. So that's the whole idea of the cache. And then the data will typically be you know, either 32 bytes or 64 bytes uh, a chunk. So that's called a cache line size or a cache block size. It's typically 64 bytes. Um, in, in most processors. Uh, some of them could be 32, some of them might go up to 128, and there's some trade-offs there. But assuming it's 64 bytes, um, you know, you, you, um, you um, uh, missed in the cache, you, you went and uh, read 64 bytes. Sorry, yeah, cache line size 64 bytes. Um, so you would, you would go um, send the request off to memory, you read all 64 bytes uh, back from memory and you stick it uh, over here. And this way, so if your example, you're, you're marching through an array um, uh, of, of ints, let's say, and pre let's pretend int is four bytes. So the first time you, you access um, uh, location zero uh, or element zero of the array, you're going to miss. 
uh, and then you go out to memory, um, you get you get uh, 64 bytes back, uh, uh, and then you read the first four bytes, which is your first element of the of the array, and then uh, now when you go to element one of the array, it's in the cache. So you don't have to go out all, all the way back to, to memory. It's right there in the cache. And if this was an L1 cache, you're talking about three, four cycles of latency uh, to read this data, as opposed to going to memory, which is you know 300 or more cycles, right? Depending on depending on the type of memory. So it's like two orders of magnitude faster to read to get data out of the L1 cache than it is to 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 go from DRAM. Which is why you know we spend all this storage, right? The, uh, you know, I showed you this picture of how much um, uh, space uh, on the chip we allocate for this. It's because of this particular particular reason. And and yeah, um, Mad Dog said Alpha had a uh, deck Alpha had 128 bytes. Yeah, so there there are there are there are um, uh, architectures where you know this data is bigger uh, and it's it. It helps in these kinds of examples, right? Where you just have a large array and you're just sequentially marching down down the array. But if your memory is very fragmented, um, uh, your accesses are all sporadic. Um, then a larger size will actually hurt you because you may only need, uh, you know, 16 bytes of that data, and you're never going to touch the remaining 48 bytes, right? Uh, and if and so you're wasting that kind of space. Uh, or and if and that problem gets worse as your cache line is is bigger. Uh, okay, uh, and then um, uh, this is kind of a sidebar. Uh, uh, the, the, the you know uh, the TLBs are are caches too. So TLB stands for translation look aside buffer, and this basically uh, stores. The translation from a virtual address to to a physical address. So you have your page tables set up that do the mapping between the virtual address and the physical address, uh, and um, and the TLB basically caches caches those translations so that you don't have to go hit up the page tables and do those lookups um, lookups every time. So uh, the, the 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 TLB is also a form of a cache. Um, it just stores translations rather than you know data, and um, it, it works very similarly, right? So every your your page your your physical ad your sorry your virtual address is split into a page number and and a page offset, and you go take the page number, look up the the TLB to see is this page number stored somewhere here, and once uh, if if it's there. Then you read the frame number, which is the physical address uh, of that of that page, uh, and then you compose your final physical address, which is basically that frame number, and these bottom bits uh, would just be copied over. So a page would be four kilobytes or eight kilobytes, uh, some somewhere like that. Um, so the bottom, if it's a four kilobyte page, you're talking about bottom twelve bits um, being this this page offset. Uh, so when 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 we deal with caches, we typically the the tag that we store is a physical address uh, because uh, uh, you know if you if you have if you index if you do the tag based on virtual address, well multiple process processes within the system can have the same virtual address. So now you have a you have a collision and you have a correctness problem. So typically, what we do is the tag that we store in the cache is actually a physical address, which means you have to go look up the TLB first, find the physical address, and then go look up the cache. And 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 there's a way to do some of this in parallel, where we take the offset, we look up the cache first, uh, and then by that time, you know the the TLB comes back with the, the with the with the frame number. And then we can do the comparison later on. Uh, and then, so so one of the problems as to why we can't make these caches even bigger, right? So 
So what's preventing us from making making these caches bigger? So A, um, you know, it costs money, right? It, the, the, the larger these caches, the more uh, the more expensive they are. But even, even if you say, okay, I, I'm, I'm very rich, I'm willing to spend a lot of money and I want bigger caches, um, just make it, you know, make it bigger. Well, the problem now is physically, um, if, you, if you see here, if this becomes bigger and bigger, you have, you have you know, this um, request coming in. Now you have a problem like that NUMA system that we talked about before, but within this cache itself, right? Physically, my request comes here and if my data lives here i have to go this far right now if you imagine if you if you double this now it has to go a further distance right so as you increase the size of the cache the average latency to get the data uh increases and therefore after a certain point uh you you see extremely diminishing returns so a larger cache does not help because uh, you're asymptotically <laughs> going to uh, uh, increase your your latency to the point where it'll start becoming closer and closer to what the DRAM latency would be. At which point, you know, you haven't you've just replicated DRAM on the chip uh, in a very expensive way. So um, so there's there's practical limits on how big these these caches can be made. But you know. Uh, what if um, what if you are willing to spend the money and but you wanted a larger cache, uh, but you didn't want to have this be higher latency also? Um, so we have a solution. So what it is is this is called three D uh, stacked cache, and and uh, uh, you know you can you can uh, AMD has a special desktop and server products which have this 3D um, stacked cache. Basically, what we are doing is um, we, are, we are stacking uh, uh, cache in a 3D fashion, like a sandwich. So you, you have your base uh, CPU at the bottom and you place uh, additional amount of cache on top. Um, and now because it's on top, um, you, it's, it's not, it's not um, bigger in x y dimension, but it's just a short hop going up, right? So it's like you know, it's like a one-story house versus a two-story house. Um, if you have a very large single-story home, then it might take you a while to walk to the other end of the house. But uh, but if you just build the same square footage on top of each other, then you're just one stairwell climb away. So that's the that's the idea behind this. And this is expensive, uh, but but it allows much much larger caches uh, with minimal increase in in latency. So the way um, the way AMD did this is you know so here's here's a um, base uh, uh, core complex. So you have all the CPU cores and then the big L3 in the middle, and we basically built another um, die. So this is another piece of silicon. Uh, which is all SRAM, uh, and we stacked it on top, and we connected the buses between these two. So, uh, so as you see in this in this picture, uh, you know you have this middle portion, which is uh, which is all extra cash. So, um, in in our current products, this can be as much as 64 megabytes of additional cash. So you have 32 megabytes of cash at the bottom, uh, 64 on top. And that gets us, uh, you know, ninety up to ninety six megabytes of cash, um, with, with without paying. So so it is expensive. You paid the cost, but the the latency is is only went up by a few cycles as opposed to you know several cycles. And 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 this was enabled through some um, magic of of packaging. Uh, so uh, when uh, when that initial die was designed, they put these uh, pillars here uh, so that uh, those would be the connectivity points to the die that would eventually sit above. So you know this is extra area we had to we had to um, build and put these pillars uh, in place. 
um, knowing that we we would want to stack uh, cash on top. And and this is what the cross section uh, looks like. Um, maybe I can try to make this zoom in a little bit. Uh, not cooperating. Okay, so this you can see um, this top uh, part here. That is the three D V cache, which is the stack. Uh, stacked cache on top, and the bottom here is our standard CPU die, and you see these um, these pillars. So these are these are what we call hybrid bonded um, copper pillars that are the connectivity between the lower cache and the upper cache. So so you're basically your data travels on these vertical wires uh, going going up, uh, and so. It's, it's much, much lower latency to go up and get the data from there. Uh, but this requires some extreme precision manufacturing, uh, which, uh, which, like I said, to me is, is magic. Because some, the pitch, I mean, I don't even remember how much, how much it is, but, but you know, the pitch on these is like few microns. Uh, and how you, how you stack them perfectly without misalignment and without shorting stuff. Um, that is all, like I said, magic to me. Okay, so that was uh, that was a description of, of uh, DRAM and, and SRAM. And let's do a quick tour of what coherency and, and consistency means. So, so cache coherency, so this is a problem where now you have multiple CPUs, um, each with their own cache, right? So we talked about in that example, each processor had its own L1 cache and L2 cache. Uh, and um, now uh, what happens if, you know, let's say all these CPUs um, needed to read a piece of data and they all put them in their local, local caches. Now, one of these CPUs decides I'm going to modify that variable. Um, so if it just did a write and update its local cache, now all, all of these other processors are going to be out of sync. They were going to have the wrong value. Uh, so cache coherency um, in the hardware solves this problem uh, of keeping all these caches um, in sync, right? So that when one processor modifies a value, uh, no other processor can see stale, stale data. And there are two different ways in which this can be accomplished. So one is by having a common system bus that connects all of these uh, processors and the caches. So what happens is when, let's say, processor one decides to modify data at a particular address, it would send the address onto this um, system bus. And then each of these other processors is monitoring that bus and says, oh, address A got sent. I'm going to check whether my cache has a copy of that address A. And if I do have a copy, I'm going to mark my copy as invalid because I know this processor has modified that value. Uh, or you could also imagine a scheme where every time this processor writes uh, the data, it also sends the data on this bus. And so any other processor that has um, that data, that address in its cache can get the new copy uh, of the data. And then eventually system main memory will also get a copy of that, of that data. So this is called, um, uh, uh, in an SNP system, this is called a, a Snoop-based protocol. So effectively, everything gets sent on a shared bus and everybody's snooping that bus to see whether it has any addresses that might be relevant to these to these caches, uh, but as you can imagine, this doesn't scale very well, right? So once you have more than a handful of processors, everybody is updating values all the time, and they all want to transmit that address onto this bus, and there is huge contention for this bus. And so, uh, because the bus is busy, this processor cannot do its right; it has to wait for. Uh, the bus to become available, and only then can it can it send send the write, and then you know you're you're a lot of times it's just busy, right? And and you just have to wait, and so you slow down performance. So this 
So the solution to that is uh, what we call a directory-based scheme or a distributed coherency scheme, where um, there is like a central directory that maintains who has copy of which which address. And so you basically send the request to this directory, and then the directory um, tells the particular processors uh, that have that address, say, OK, this processor is updating. Therefore, you need to get this new value. So uh, think of it as essentially, uh, instead of this being a broadcast, this is a point-to-point -point messaging scheme. So it's more scalable. And in order to achieve this, like uh, this picture is hard to read, but I, I didn't want, um, uh, you know, it, it's 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 kind of this is each each cache, um, you know, in the directory will maintain the state, whether a particular cache line is is modified or 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 clean or invalid, and so you can you ping pong between these different states depending on who's reading and and who's writing. Uh, so that was coherency, um, and coherency in you know in all modern CPUs is largely a solved problem. You know there are scalable scalability challenges, of course, but you know over time we've settled down on on a set of algorithms um, that that can uh, do this consistently. Uh, but memory consistency is is a different thing. So while coherence deals with um, multiple um, accesses to the to the same address consistency has to do with the ordering of requests to different addresses so so here's an example right um, where you have two CPUs um, uh, running some code uh, CPU 0 sets data equals one and then sets flag equals one and the CPU 1 is basically polling for flag to be equal to one and then it's uh, reading data and prints it. So if both flag and data were zero initially before this section of code started executing, what do you think would get printed? And consistency is uh, what provides the answer to that question. Uh, it may not always be what you think it is, but, but, but at least it has to be repeatable. So every time this happens, it has to be, uh, you should get the same answer. Um, or at least if you follow the rules, you should get the same answer. So, um, so basically the consistency model uh, defines um, uh, the contract between the programmer and the system. And um, as long, so basically the system guarantees that if you follow these rules for operations of memory, then your, your program behavior will be consistent. And, and you, no matter how many times you run this program, you will get the same result, right? Whether you're reading, writing, or updating this, this memory. And, um, you know, for, for all the different things for which uh, Leslie Lamport was uh, awarded the, 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 the Turing uh, Prize, uh, uh, you know, this is, this is one of his major achievements where he, where he defined a framework for, for, for consistency. And, and uh, you know, he defines this model called sequential consistency in which every thread basically executes operations in very strict order and uh, and that way the, the 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 behavior is completely predictable uh, but this is like you know very limiting in terms of performance and you know no current major ISA actually implements it and so what the different other consistency models define is to extend to which, you know, read after write, write after read, read after write, and then write after write orderings are maintained. And remember, these are two different addresses. If they are request to the same addresses, then program order behavior has to be followed, right? So if you have two writes to the same address, you, you cannot reorder those. Um, so, you know, uh, over time, uh, different consistency models have, have evolved. Uh, so if you look at x86 or AMD64, um, they implement uh, a flavor called uh, total store ordering, uh, where basically uh, uh, stores from the same thread appear in, in order. But then some of the other things can be relaxed, most particularly 
um, the the write followed by a read case can be the last, as long as those are two different addresses. So if you have a write of address A, and then sometime later you want to read address B, you could do the read ahead of the write because you can look ahead and say, okay, I'm going to need this value. And remember, it takes such a long time to to go to DRAM or even you know higher levels in the cache hierarchy that if I execute this earlier, then I can get the the load um, sooner, right? So you so in in this model you can relax this ordering because in in sequential consistency you would have to do the write and then do the read, uh, but here there is some relaxing so that you can get higher performance. Uh, and if you look at ARM or or Risk Five, um, they have very very weak ordering. So in the previous example, right, um, uh, in in an x86 system. Uh, right after right ordering has to be maintained, which means if flag is one, data is guaranteed to be one because they would have come out in this order. So if you were polling for flag to be one and you print data, data would always be one in this example. But in ARM, um, it's very weak ordering. And if you wrote code like this um, and expected data to be one, you would be wrong. Any anything is possible in this case. Uh, you know, you 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 might have uh, you might have uh, uh, you know flipped uh, flag and and data ordering, right? So your your flag might have been written first, and the data might be written written later. Or this read of data could have happened before this before this read of flag happened. So 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 it's possible that you you data got printed as zero because this this read as part of this print executed before either of these writes could have uh, happened so um so it it's uh it now then it comes uh on the part of the programmer to understand all of this so this is this is getting to the title of the talk really after uh an hour plus of of boring matter uh is like why does any of this stuff matter right uh so, so first of all, code performance is is very dependent on caches and and memory system. So here's an example C code of a simple matrix addition. So the text in green uh, will get you very good performance on modern systems, and the text in red, although functionally the same, would be bad because uh, you know uh, C stores uh, data in row major format so you want to keep the same row and increment the column so as you go incrementing the column you will have locality uh, but fortran does does column major and so you are better off flipping it um in in if you're right if you're trying to implement this equivalent array in fortran you want to do it the, the other way so and and this can have you know the difference between these two i just wrote some toy code on my system, it's more than an order of magnitude difference uh, in 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 execution times for for the green loop versus the red loop. And then similarly, like you know, uh, LLMs are large language models are all the rage these days. Um, and you know, partitioning the problem because they have such billions of parameters, uh, partitioning the problem and and putting um, the working set. Uh, such that you know most of that can fit in the cache, and then and then knowing what should be cached and what should not be cached is is critical to achieve high performance because some data is inherently ephemeral in nature. You're never going to reuse that data again, so there is no point in in putting that um, in your cache. Uh, you're better off saving the cache uh, locations for for data that you're likely to access uh, over and over again. Uh, and, you know, talking up, you know, we talked about all those memory timings. Um, so, uh, you know, graphics shaders or, or general purpose GPU compute kernels have to be very aware of that DRAM layout um, and the timings um, in order to extract maximum bandwidth utilization. You need to be, you need to know how many channels you have so that you're interleaving your requests across all of those channels and, and, and getting the maximum bandwidth 
uh, possible. Uh, <clears throat> and then, you know, from, from a consistency model perspective, uh, uh, you know, compilers, or if you're writing any hand-optimized assembly, you have to deal with the, with the consistency model. And fences have to be inserted uh, based on the on the target architecture. So going back to that to that example, if you really want um, a flag to be written after data is written, right? Um, uh, then you need to put some kind of barrier here, yeah? so a, a fence here, to make sure that all operations before that fence complete, before any operations after the fence complete. So this way. Uh, and you'll have to put a fence here too. You don't want these two uh, requests being being reordered. Um, but but if your if your system guarantees certain ordering, then having those fences is unnecessary, and it will cause you loss in in performance. So I mean, this is about the hardware based uh, models. But you also have language runtimes and the virtual machines, like the Java virtual machine, uh, can have their own kind of ordering behavior. And so uh, you as a programmer do have to be aware of all of these uh, in, in order to write uh, optimal code. Uh, and this is the last slide. Uh, if you learn anything from this talk, please do not orphan your memory channels, by which I mean, if your system has two memory channels, please populate both channels. Uh, I see so many um, laptops, especially that are sold, which have two memory channels uh, and they have 16 gigs of RAM, which you think is great, but it's a, it's a single DIMM populated on a on a single channel. You're much better off getting two eight gig sticks and putting them on both channels, and that way you get double the bandwidth. And 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 when you're populating uh, these memory channels, try to be as symmetric as possible. Every channel should have the same amount of capacity. That way is when you get um, most symmetric and most optimal performance. Thank you. Thanks, Shankar. Yeah, that was a great talk. Uh, I see a comment about fault sharing. Yes, that is that is also very, very um, important when 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 you have a cache line where one processor is, is using the first, let's say 16 bytes of that cache line, and another processor is using the second 16 bytes of, the path, uh, of that cache line. So really they're not touching the same uh, set of data, they just happen to be in that same 64 byte cache line. And then you'll have this ping pong of this line between two different caches, and that can kill performance too. So you're better off splitting these two into two separate 64 byte lines so that there is no contention. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Because everybody has talked out. <laughs> <laughs> Well, my email is on the BLU page. So if you have questions later, feel free to email me. Okay. Oh, Shankar, can you send a copy of the slides to post on the Blue website? Yes, I will send it to you, Deborah. Okay, thanks.